Let me say that uh, it's wonderful and truly an honor to be giving the lecture in uh, recognizing Paul Armstrong. He is a close friend. I think uh, him almost as a brother. Spent a lot of time with him. Uh, there's no doubt when we come to gender, he is clearly a male <clears throat> and an alpha male at that. Paul is uh, a wonderful, uh, you know, when I was the dean and I'd come in early in the morning, uh, I would see his car there, and I used to think, he's beat me here, <clears throat> and uh, maybe he's just away on a holiday or at another conference. So I'd quietly walk by the car and put my hand on the hood to see if the car was warm or not. <clears throat> and when it was warm, I knew he'd beat me in and I could phone him. And uh, many of the meetings with Paul were always very early in the morning. I want to thank the organizers, not only for this, but a great program the last few days, uh, the last two days. It really has been uh, an excellent program. And I think that my talk is really a collateral addition to this program, because the diseases I talk about are diseases that are frequently transmitted by addiction. I also want to thank the friends of CIHR for the tremendous uh, talks by Harvey Fein Feinberg. Um, hope this moves forward. Okay. Paul is uh, was just a visionary leader, strategic thinker, but often very passionate about whatever he's doing, focused, ambitious, and tenacious. And clearly these were the qualities that allowed for this organization to be uh, formed and successfully established. There's no doubt that uh, if you want to get something done, you can ask Paul. So uh, my talk will go through a bit of a historical account of some of the contributions I think we've made to hepatitis B and hepatitis C. And in this current environment of uh, stressing translation, we've seen from Neil Cashman what he's doing in the area of translation and commercialization, which uh, governments, both provincial and federal, seem to be highly focused on. And I'll touch briefly on the Li Kaixing Institute. <clears throat> Persistent viral infections really fall into three major categories. HIV AIDS, about 45,000 in Canada, about 40 million worldwide. Hepatitis C, about 240 to 300,000 in Canada, and about 130 to 170 million worldwide. And Hep B, about 300,000 in Canada, and about uh, 400 million worldwide. The question you can ask, are you one of 12? One person in 12 in the world either carries hepatitis B or hepatitis C. So it is uh, very, these are very common diseases. Bloomberg discovered the virus for hepatitis B and was Nobel laureate in uh, 1976, along with Carlton Geideschek, who we heard today about. <clears throat> they both received it for discovering unusual viruses. And uh, Bloomberg uh, passed away about a year ago, but uh, was truly uh, remarkable in his work on uh, hepatitis. Hepatitis B, about one in three people in the world have been infected with hepatitis B, about two billion infected, and about 400 million remain chronic carriers. And 15 to 40 percent of those carrying hepatitis B will either develop cirrhosis or liver cancer. And there's about a million people a year die from liver cancer. And uh, <clears throat> we're not, uh, in, as you see different parts of the world, the red areas, immigration has a big effect on uh, the distribution of this disease around the world. And uh, we have high carrier rates in the northern part of uh, Canada as well. <clears throat> I just want to say the most important thing probably is not the work we're doing on antivirals, but a good vaccine. The vaccines were developed for many years ago. However, the, the policy of vaccine policy was not really the best. We targeted high-risk people. And uh, I couldn't help but think back to, as we were talking about social issues and how we change laws, you know that we vaccinate children in grade five in Canada and most places to prevent hepatitis B or C or hepatitis B transmission when they become sexually active or IV drug use. 
The major force behind that was a child in the family in Vancouver who died of hepatitis B after running away from home for a period of about three months, came home and was home for a short period, developed acute fulminant hepatitis and died. The mother of that child was so incensed to think there could have been a vaccine that prevented it, she led major efforts in Ottawa to bring attention to this problem, and that resulted in the hepatitis B vaccine in grade five. The vaccine is extremely effective. Mothers transmit this disease to infants at birth, and if you carry hepatitis B and you've got DNA in your blood as a mother and you have a baby that's born, you have virtually a 100% chance you're gonna transmit it to the baby if the virus is in high levels. However, the vaccine has been able to block that transmission. Vaccination at birth prevents the infant from getting it even though exposed at birth. And this is the most important effort that's gone on around the world. And I'll just show you, this is truly a vaccine that prevents cancer. <clears throat> and if you look at the, uh, the results of the use of uh, the vaccine in Taiwan, the first country in the world to use it and vaccinate every child at birth, you can see the pre-vaccination incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma in children has decreased and the carrier rates have markedly decreased. The World Health Organization now targets to reduce the carrier rate of hepatitis B to less than 2% of the world uh, in most countries. <clears throat> and as of 2009, 92% of the world's countries vaccinate infants at birth. So, hep how co of course, vaccine does nothing for those that are carriers. And I began in 1980s seeing and trying to treat some patients with hepatitis B with some rather primitive antivirals, including ERA-A and ERA-A mon monophosphate. Because you'd see patients with hepatitis B and we never really could do anything for them. And uh, <clears throat> these patients often had liver fibrosis, cirrhosis, and went on to develop cancer. And as I point out, hepatitis B is the second most common environmental cause of cancer worldwide, next to smoking. And uh, hepatitis B is the primary cause of hepatocellular carcinoma, hepatitis C, second most common. Both in cirrhosis and in hepatocellular carcinoma, the level of hepatitis B DNA in the blood is a clear indication of the risks and you can just see in both these diseases, the risk increases with the increased level of the virus. My original research in 1986, I was still had a CHR or MRC grant at that time to work on measles and measles and MS. And uh, I was teaching a graduate course in biochemistry. I think this is important, the teaching and research do go together. And uh, that course, I had to review a new paper, <clears throat> prepared to give a talk on hepatitis B for the first time, reviewed a new paper that appeared from Jesse Summers and Bill Mason on how this virus replicated. And it was extremely unique because it was the only DNA virus that replicated by going through an RNA intermediate and back to DNA. After finishing the course and thinking about this paper, I called Jesse Summers and I said, and uh, <clears throat> This is the replication that's very similar to HIV, except in hepatitis B, there is a protein priming step. Your DNA and my DNA is pro primed by an RNA, but in these, some viruses, proteins actually, the first nucleotide of the DNA is attached to a protein. And in hepatitis B, there was a protein priming step for the polymerase. The <coughs> one end of the polymerase acts as a primer protein to start the DNA synthesis. As I thought about this more and more, I thought there were some unique targets that we might be able to inhibit with hepatitis B. Called Jesse Summers and said, Jesse, has anybody talked to you about using this model of, in the duct to look for antivirals for the human virus? And he said, no. And I said, are you interested in doing that? And he said, no. I'm a basic scientist. <clears throat> and uh, I said, would you mind if I tried to do that? And he said, no, I'd be happy to see somebody do it. So I sent a postdoc down to Jesse Summer and Fox Chase, Sotaro Suzuki, and we set up the duck model back in my lab. I won't go through the replication, but the replication just shows, and most important, you'll see the small in the nucleus, the CCC DNA. That stands for covalently closed circular DNA, and the hepatitis B virus 
in order to replicate, I'm not sure how I use this pointer to... Uh, that star? Got it. This CCC DNA is a little mini chromosome. And the real problem in the treatment of hepatitis B, as you'll see later, is we can suppress the virus, but we don't cure it because this is extremely stable. We did studies to show that it has got a half-life essentially that of the hepatocyte. So it is like a little mini chromosome as part of the replication. And it serves for the messenger RNA and the protein synthesis. And we use most of the antivirals out here inhibiting this part, but not this part. So there was no cell culture in 1986, but the virus had been discovered, and Jesse Summers had used primary hepatocytes of the duck to work this out. It's very similar to the human virus, <clears throat> and it also just recently been discovered in the woodchucks, and uh, so we decided to try to use this. And this just shows the similarity between the human virus, the duck virus, and the human virus. They're very similar. There's one extra protein in the human and the woodchuck called the X protein, and human and woodchucks develop cancer. Woodchucks, in fact, in about three years, develop cancer of the liver. The ducks never develop cancer of the liver, and we know that the X protein is very much involved. Well, not after, after I finished uh, thinking about this, and actually before I phoned Jesse Summers, I spoke to a chemist at the University of Alberta, Morris Robbins, a tremendous nucleoside chemist. In fact, Norris had synthesized the dideoxypurines, DDA and DDG, uh, the first time anybody was able to synthesize those in the world. And Sanger called Morris to see if he could get DDA and DDG from him when he did his Sanger sequencing of DNA, because he could get DDC and DDT, but not the uh, two purines. And Morris supplied Sanger with those, and as you know, Sanger went on and won a Nobel Prize. He was truly an outstanding chemist, and this collaboration started by drawing out the cycle of hepatitis B replication on a napkin in the faculty club, <clears throat> and from that day on, we were totally linked that we could do this. <clears throat> Let me just say that uh, just recently, Morris has come back and is now consulting with us in the Li Kai Shing, as we do need more chemistry help. Of course, raising the ducks was the other problem I didn't have any money for this study when I began it, <clears throat> so I raised the ducks on my parents' farm. I've got to tell you that my mom and dad thought I was absolutely crazy, particularly my dad, who had never raised a duck in his life. But they faithfully would raise these ducks, collect the eggs. I'd go out on the weekends and pick them up and come back and hatch them and set up primary duck hepatocytes in my lab. And this is a slide that is, for me, historic because it was the first time I really saw antivirals that worked against hepatitis B. But across the top is virus growing, and at 20 days, the darker the dot, the more virus. <clears throat> DDT, dideoxythymidine, 20 days, had actually no effect at all. Dideoxycytidine had no effect. Era A that I had tried in some patients had an effect. Not very good, but I want to point out that down here, the dideoxyguanine was extremely potent and more than 10,000 times as potent as the DDC or the DDT. DDC had some toxicity as well. And the reason we thought this happened is that the downstream incorporation of dideoxyguanine, sorry, I should have backed that up, dideoxyguanine <clears throat> could be proofread, uh, uh, dideoxy, the C or T or downstream, they could be proofread out. We believe this polymerase of the virus could proofread it. But if you hooked the DDG, which was the first nucleotide, to that primer protein, it could not be proofread out because that's a nucleotide protein bond that would be resistant to being read out. And uh, I won't go into the details, but we were able to do that. And of course, the natural product has got a hydroxyl here, but the dideoxy does not. And we can show that in the replicating cores we isolated, absolutely no DNA synthesis when we put in DDG. So we were excited that we had the first antiviral. We wondered if it would work in animals. We were able to buy some, <coughs> or have a grant from the Alberta 
a Heritage Foundation for $25,000 to buy some synthesized material and put it into ducks. <clears throat> and uh, this just shows the ducks that were treated with placebo after one week, two weeks, three weeks, with DDG, prodrug, one week, two weeks, three weeks, and four animals treated with DDA. And DDA gets converted to DDI, and it's not very effective. But DDG prodrugs were extremely effective, as you can see. And we published uh, this, uh, uh, the difference between the purines and the primidines. That led to a collaboration with Glaxo, uh, Glaxo Welcome, uh, <coughs> later. But Glaxo, we actually went in, Morris and I went to see Glaxo and researched Triangle Park. And after about a 20 minute uh, or 40 minute discussion, they brought back the uh, president of Glaxo at the time, or the CEO, <coughs> Dr. Saunders, I remember walking in and he said, uh, we're gonna work with you. And that was uh, the beginning of our collaboration with Glaxo. In that collaboration, long story short, we screened a lot of compounds for them because they had a lot in sight. And we asked them if we could screen a new compound they just licensed from Biochem Pharma called lamivudine. And uh, they said, we're just sending you a bunch of compounds but we found in this screening system <clears throat> that we screened them in duplicates. It was a bit crude, but we found a compound, three compounds that were very effective in this uh, study with them. And all three turned out to be different lots of lamivudine. So lamivudine became the lead compound in these studies. Now this is a little surprising because it's a pyr pyrimidine, but we knew that it worked in HIV in the similar areas we wanted to test out here. Lamivudine is made in like a right hand and a left hand glove. And the D and L isomers, or minus an antimer of lamivudine was very active against hepatitis B, and it was non-toxic. The plus an antimer was not active at all, and was very toxic. So you have gotta be lucky in this game as well. And uh, that's just, uh, we reported all of that back to Glaxo. And let me point out, it was first synthesized by Bernard Barlow at McGill. Biochem Farmer was a spin-off, sorry. And uh, Glaxo licensed it, and we had requested to study it. And we went on and published the mechanism of that, which is actually it gets incorporated, but it can't be proofread out because of the uh, L isomer being incorporated in such a way that it, it doesn't. It's resistant to uh, proofreading, whereas the dideoxycytidine was not. That led us back to the ducks and said, what happens uh, if we put this into ducks, lamivudine? This is the placebo and this is the ducks. This is hours, eight hours, 16 hours, 24 hours. You could see how rapidly with high doses we could inhibit this virus. We then wanted to know if it would work in the human virus and we went back to, uh, with Glaxo and found a colony of chimpanzees in New Iberia, Louisiana. These chimps were extremely well looked after. They had. Uh, <clears throat> Fisher Price playpens and toys, and diapers and nurses, but we found three of the infant chimps that carried hepatitis B that had been born to chimps that had received the placebo during the vaccine studies. We screened about 68 chimps and found these three little ones. They loved to drink tang, and we fed them tang, spiked each day with lamivudine. And we brought the samples back to the University of Alberta after collecting them over a long period of time. And this is the dose response curve that we saw with 0.1 milligram, 0.3, 1, and you could see how rapidly the hepatitis B disappeared. That led to a clinical trial that we led <coughs> in patients uh, shortly thereafter. And any patient that received 100 milligrams or more had rather greater than three dog drop in the virus within, uh, within uh, uh, a period of 30 days. I actually submitted this to New England Journal of Medicine. There were 72 patients in this study, and uh, <clears throat> placebo showed no effect, of course, five milligrams, about 70%, 20 milligrams, 90%, and the others were greater than three logs. <clears throat> New England said it wasn't of sufficient reader interest, and uh, it was sent back and published elsewhere, but uh, Surprisingly, the first uh, clinical trial was surprised, uh, published by people who refereed this paper. <clears throat> Let me say that, uh, thank goodness, we had presented it at ASLD and shown this trial of limiting for the treatment of chronic hepatitis was the first 
trial that had ever been done, and it established the dose that is still used today uh, from this trial. There are over 4,000 papers published with lamivudine and hepatitis B since then, <clears throat> but this is one of the early ones and an important one out of Taiwan. Just showed that in a chronic study using lamivudine, if you're on placebo or lamivudine, you can see that the progression of the disease was markedly slow. This was designed to be a five-year study. It was stopped after three years because they thought it was unethical to continue uh, on placebo. And the incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma could be affected with the therapy as well. And there are a number of other studies that show the treatment of hepatitis B and dropping the DNA has a very beneficial effects in the treatment group or control groups. And this is control group with cancer of the liver and treated group. So <clears throat> another important aspect this time was at this time, hepatitis B patients who had end-stage liver disease were being eliminated from transplant programs because the liver got reinfected quickly and developed a more aggressive form of hepatitis called fibrosing cholestatic hepatitis. So many people thought it was a waste of livers if you put them into these patients. In 1994, we did the first liver transplant with lamivudine pre and post transplant at the University of Alberta. Uh, Norm Canedon was the surgeon, Vincent Bain was the hepatologist, and it was one of my patients that had come from uh, Hong Kong but had end-stage liver disease at age 38, and Morris and I had, uh, were very happy to see this patient post-transplant uh, did very well. Now, let me just say this patient uh, received lamivudine pre-transplant and post-transplant along with H human immunoglobulin and his liver remained completely free of hepatitis B. This is a picture but the disease liver taken out and stained two years later. There was no sign of hepatitis B in the liver. <clears throat> he remained on lamivudine for eight, nine years and went to the transplant clinic one day and somebody said, well, you've been on this so long, I'm sure there's no virus there now, we can stop it. I didn't know about that, but he came back, that was in May, and he came back in the middle of August in fulminant hepatitis and unfortunately died. And of course now we keep patients with transplants on lamivudine or on an antiviral pre and post transplant, as this uh, is a way you can prevent the liver and it opened up the transplants to these people. Another major question is, can these antivirals reverse fibrosis and first cirrhosis? And many studies have shown that there is, this is an actual example from the University of Toronto, Ian Wanless was sent along, and this is the pre-treatment biopsy, and after two and a half years on lamivudine, uh, it uh, looked very good, <clears throat> no sign of cirrhosis. And Ian Wanless sent this to me and said, you'll be interested in this patient, uh, was on your drug lamivudine for two and a half years and shows a nice improvement in his liver. So <clears throat> in advanced liver disease, we start putting them on lamivudine or on newer antivirals today. There are many better drugs. Uh, and patients with decompressed hepatitis B cirrhosis can return to pretty good liver function and 70% of them come off the liver transplant list while they're on treatment with an antiviral uh, during the therapy. The problem with lamivudine is resistance. And early on, I tried to enlarge uh, Galaxo. We continue to work with the purine analogs because we were concerned with this resistance problem. And <clears throat> this virus has a, uh, it's the protein primer, the DNA polymerase, and RNAsH domains within it. And within the polymerase, there is a YMDD motif and Carl Fisher in my lab, uh, all of these viruses have this YMDD motif, and Carl mutated, used site-specific mutagenesis to change the methionine to a valine, and when we put this into uh, <clears throat> the cell culture system, this is the wild-type virus treated with DDC, had no effect, but with 3TC, or lamivudine, there was good effect, in the mutated virus, didn't re replicate as well, but you can see that lamivudine had no effect. So we were concerned that a single mutation could lead to resistance. And <clears throat> at the end of this paper, we said this report of a genetically engineered lamivudine resistant to patinaviruses serves as a cautionary note 
of what could occur when lamivudine is used in prolonged therapy or monotherapy. <clears throat> and very soon after this was used in patients, we started to see lamivudine resistance and we characterized a number of those mutants with Galaxo. So <clears throat> there has been the landscape of hepatitis B has changed. Lamivudine was the first drug licensed in 1998, Adepavir in 2002, and Tecavir, Tilapavir, and Tenofovir. So there's, a, there's now five nucleoside analogs licensed for hepatitis B, and there's no question that the best two are entecavir and tenofovir. And why are they the best? <clears throat> you want to normalize liver enzymes. You want hepatitis B to be undetectable. You hope to see a seroconversion of E antigen, improve liver histology, and we'd like to see some people lose surface antigen and no longer be car become carriers. That's the ultimate goal. If you just look at this slide, it shows very clearly <clears throat> that the patients that have been on either or tenofovir or entecovir have the best suppression of the virus, negative DNA after one year in the E-antigen negative. E-antigen negative patients have a lower level of virus and it's easier in E-antigen positive. Uh, also, this was the best. Lamivudine is the yellow one here. <clears throat> But most important is resistance. And after five years of use with lamivudine, 70% of the patients had resistant virus. In the patients that were treated with uh, tenofovir after five years, there's virtually no resistance. And in tecavir, there's no resistance. By the way, both in tecavir and tenofovir are purine analogs that do block the protein priming as well as the polymerase. The recommendations today are for tenofovir or entecovir as the first line of therapy for hepatitis B naive patients because they're the most potent and least likely to develop resistance. So I'm going to move on very briefly to hepatitis C. <clears throat> this is non-A, non-B hepatitis, the virus discovered in 1989 by Michael Houghton working at Chiron. It's in the flavivirus family, positive strand RNA virus, seven genotypes, 0.8% of Canadians, or 243,000 uh, Canadians are carriers, and this, of course, was the subject of the Creever inquiry in the tainted blood. This is a picture of Michael Houghton, who is now a Canada Excellence Research Chair in Virology at the University of Alberta in the Li Kai Sheng. He also, by the way, was, this year, was selected this year as the Gardner winner, international Gardner winner, but unfortunately for me, as the chair of the Gardner board and for John Dirks, Michael decided to decline the award, first time this has happened, and uh, he declined it simply because he had two colleagues that worked with him from day one, Kui Lim Chu and George Ku, and you'll see them on all of his papers, and he said what should have been the happiest day in his life after he accepted it for a few hours was one of the most difficult days in his life because he felt George and Kui Lim had to be included in any awards that he was going to accept from then on. So uh, and you can find an editorial or opinion written in Nature, at, uh, inv invited to write it in Nature, on why he took this decision on J July the 8th. It's the most common bloodborne disease in North America and Western Europe. Uh, as I mentioned, about 4 million Americans. Acute infection has decreased with the advent of discovering the virus, and uh, 30, about uh, 65 to 80 percent of these patients become chronic carriers, and about, as we know, there's a large number worldwide. And this just shows that <clears throat> with the, the Creever inquiry was about the fact that in the U.S. in 1986, they decided to do surrogate testing to try to prevent the transmission of uh, non-A, non-B. By that I mean they measured liver enzymes in all donors. And if the enzymes were elevated, those samples were automatically eliminated. In Canada, we decided not to do that. And from 1986 to 1990, a number of people got blood that was tainted. Uh, the test was developed in 1990 and licensed by Chiron to several companies and with that genera uh, the first generation and the second generation testing, you could quickly eliminate hepatitis C from the blood donors. 
at one point, if you went into ICU, there was a greater than a 30% chance you'd come out of ICUs with non-A, non-B, as it was a very common problem. And uh, decreased, as you got the epidemiology understood, and decreased the use of, uh, <coughs> of the use of these in uh, injection drug use. As I mentioned, there are seven genotypes. By far the most common is genotype 1A and 1B, makes up about 70% of the cases. Genotype 3, about 20%, and genotype 2, uh, 5 to 10% in Canada. And today, the most common way it's transmitted, of course, is intravenous drug use, counts for about 60% of the cases. Sexual transmission uh, is still counts for some of these cases. And of course, over time, uh, these patients <coughs> do develop uh, chronic liver disease. So in 1998, when we began working on this, there was no cell cultures, and the only animals were chimps and humans. And we planned to try to develop an antiviral, uh, a new animal model for hepatitis C, because we knew the value that the duck had been in the work we were doing. And I want to acknowledge right at the beginning David Mercer, who was a graduate student with Norm Kniedemann working on this project. David was a, uh, a surgery resident who took time out to do a, a PhD to try to create an animal model. And uh, <clears throat> without him, I, I know we would not have had this model. He's uh, terrific. But David was putting human hepatocytes into skid beige mice. He was putting them into the spleen, and they'd travel into the liver. And he would get a signal of albumin, human albumin, two weeks later, but it would peter out. And this is just our marker for a human albumin. But it was the way we measured how well the graft was engrafting. And <clears throat> so uh, one of these, uh, I commented to David on his committee. I said, we need to find a way to disadvantage the mouse hepatocytes so the human hepatocytes can compete in the animal model. And <clears throat> uh, we found a paper, Carl Fisher, my lab, found a paper and uh, heard a talk by Brinster where they had put in a transgene that knocked out uh, the mouse hepatocytes. So we, this is a four copies of the urokinase gene under the albumin promoter. And <clears throat> this means you'd overexpress urokinase in the liver cells, and it destroys them. And uh, <clears throat> we crossed these into skid beige mice, and we'd end up with mice that carried this transgene as well as the skid beige gene, so it wouldn't reject human cells. And when we put these, this is just looking at a transgenic mouse that was homozygous, you get this very pale color, this is a normal liver. Hemizygous mice, sometimes they'd lose the transgene and they'd have normal cells coming up in their liver. And uh, we would take human liver cells, uh, perfuse a bit of the liver from uh, the time of that surgery, normal liver tissue, and uh, put some of those cells into the spleen, and they'd start growing in the liver. And this is a mouse liver that has been transplanted or has got the uh, human cells in all these islands are islands of human cells. Let me just say that we could then, <clears throat> this is the same mouse under different times, just showing that over time uh, the islets of human cells at six weeks grew into pretty well a humanized liver by the time of 17 weeks. So we were producing mice with human livers and I told you how the albumin disappeared. Now when we looked at the albumin levels, it began to increase. And <clears throat> when we infected these animals with hepatitis C, they did, we had one animal. We infected 22 animals, thinking we were going to get a bunch of them with hepatitis C. Actually, only one animal got it at that first experiment. But, you know, once you have one animal, that the mouse that had hepatitis C, that was exciting, but we had to figure out why did that mouse happened to get it, others did not. And we found that if the transgene was there in a homozygous form, there was two copies of it, that mouse was the only one that got infected. And when we looked at the ability of the mice to sustain human cells, if they were homozygous in black, you can see how high the level of human albumin became, or alpha-1 antitrypsin in the blood, and if they were hemizygous, they got some, but not nearly as much. So it became imperative that uh, you had to have the homozygous transgene. And we patented this mouse, and uh, after we showed that it could sustain hepatitis C, and these levels of hepatitis C are very similar to the levels you see in a human. 
And we could show, we had to show that it was passed from mouse to mouse, that it was truly the infectious virus. And that was published in Nature Medicine in 2001 and considered that year as the breakthrough in hepatitis C uh, research. <clears throat> and David Mercer was the lead author on that paper. And this is the first mouse in the world to ever have hepatitis C. And uh, from there on, we I, I should point out that uh, uh, when Dr. Feinberg was here, he mentioned that, the chi that they've stopped using chimpanzees. And in that report of the Institute of Medicine, they referred to the skid uh, beige mouse and the urokinase overexpression, which is our mouse, as having a major effect on the use of the necessity to use chimpanzees in these studies, that this could replace it. So there have been lots of new tools developed. The Replicon, the cell culture system in 2005 by uh, Wakita and animal models has led to really opening up the field for new antivirals for hepatitis C. And this virus is synthesized at log polyprotein. It is cleaved into both structural and non-structural proteins. And the non-structural proteins are critical for the virus replication. And a number of new antivirals have been directed against these non-structural proteins, particularly the NS3, the protease, and the NS4B, the uh, are five, uh, so A and B, but particularly the uh, RNA polymerase, as well as NS5A is another major target for antivirals. And through the work uh, that has gone on, Tilapavir and Bozepavir were licensed in 2011 and reduced the or increased the sustained viral response rate from about 50% to 75%. And there are now almost 200 drugs that are in development for hepatitis C. And over the, this just shows you what's coming. But this shows in many of these, we're looking at 99 to a, uh, near 100% sustained viral response. Hepatitis C will be the first chronic viral infection that almost everyone will be cured. This is Abbott's study in genotype 1B. They have virtually 100% in almost all the different arms of their studies. In genotype 1A, the response rate isn't quite as high, but it's still exceptionally good. What is happening is the evolution of the treatment of hepatitis C. No disease has seen so much change in the last few years as hepatitis C, but we are at 75% genotype 1. We're going to be above 90% and will be interferon-free within the next two to three years. Let me just say, what is the difference between a patient who has a sustained viral response and one that doesn't? This is uh, adapted from uh, JAMA last year, just showing that the patients that have a sustained viral response, the chance of dying of liver disease dramatically decreased, and those that don't, it continues to climb. So ideally, we'll have interferon therapy, once a day oral therapy. It'll work for all genotypes. And uh, we hope it'll be less costly than the current ones, which are very expensive. So I've had a journey through discovery to translation to commercialization. I just want to say that uh, we developed the first oral antiviral for hepatitis B in 1998. It was licensed. It's still licensed in over 200 countries. Cumulative sales from uh, Glaxo have been somewhat over $6 billion, and it's commonly prescribed in China. Antiviral resistance is common, and it's being replaced by others. Our mouse model, we've also patented the mouse, <clears throat> set up a small company called KMT Hepatech. Uh, it was incorporated in 2001. We moved off the campus in 2003 when we got our first contracts from Chiron and Wythe, and we've signed 67 NDAs with different companies to work with the mouse model. The NIH gave us a contract in 2006, and we still have that contract on a yearly basis to test compounds for NIH researchers, uh, for them free of charge, but the NIH pays us to do the testing. And we were fortunate enough to win Bio Alberta Award, and uh, last year the Aztec Award is the company of the year in the province of Alberta. Li Kaixing is a philanthropist, and he set up a series of network of institutes, as he calls it, in Shanto University, Medical College and other sites, and we established the Li Kaixing Institute at the University of Alberta in 2010, and uh, we got funding from Genome Canada for a lot of the infrastructure in hepatitis work and uh, 
viral immunology, and uh, the donation from Mr. King, a promise from the Alberta government that's been hard to get uh, all of that money through, and uh, recruiting Michael Houghton with the chair, and Galaxo has helped us as well. Uh, Michael Houghton and I uh, have recently decided we're going to create two institutes, uh, and this is partly because the government's so anxious that you make sure you separate your funding for translation from in, that none of it goes into discovery research. So the Li Kai-shing Institute of Virology is the discovery arm, <clears throat> and the Li Kai-shing Applied Virology Institute, where we can separate uh, the funding and the accounting uh, to cover the translational work. And uh, I just want to say that a lot of people helped me with the hepatitis B. As you know, I was a dean for 10 years, and during that period of dean, uh, many people in this group were extremely helpful in carrying on and keeping the lab running during the time uh, that I was the dean of medicine. Particularly the gentleman in the front in the blue shirt, Carl Fisher, uh, was there through both eras and tremendously helpful. Thanks to the research support from CHR, Alberta Heritage, the University Hospital, Glaxo, Albert Innovates and the Li Kai-shing Foundation. Thank you very much.